The people who populated the United States were all born risk takers. That's what made New York the center of the financial world, was once the telegraph came in in the 1840s. Well, the financial system on the hand, Wall Street, has worked very, very well. Technology and financial capital together, to me, is the duopoly of our world. Wall Street is not as dominant as it used to be, but it still has a plenty of clout. Today, Silicon Valley is the, the global power here, where both money and technology tend to reside. China is no longer a rising power. I think it's reached its peak, and as the stresses are beginning to show up, the Chinese certainly are very good at industrial espionage. The winner and the great again has got to be parallel. New inventions change the world overnight. Complacency is, is a one-way ticket to disaster. I'm in a rapidly changing world. I am excited to be here on this podcast episode of the Great Tech Game podcast today with Mr. John Steele Gordon, someone who's written incredible number of books in the fields that I find fascinating. He's a business and economic historian whose books have covered various parts of the rise of the United States, the economic and banking history of the United States, the rise of the Wall Street phenomenon as in our world history, and many other pieces that we'll get into today. So welcome, Mr. Gordon. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Today, I'm excited to talk to you about various pieces of the work that you've done over the last several decades. I particularly benefited greatly from the work you've done around both the rise of the United States as a business and an economic power, of course, from the history of the Wall Street that you've written about, and of course, other things also that I found specifically very fascinating, which I'm hoping we'll get into also, which was, for example, the undersea cables, the telegraph cables that got laid between the United States and the United Kingdom of the time. So I'm looking forward to speaking to you about all of that uh, in our conversation today. But first, let's talk about the rise of the United States. In my book, The Great Tech Game, one of the things I tried to do, Mr. Gordon, I think as you might uh, also know, is I've tried to place the current technological competition between nation states that is currently going on in a longer historical context. And to do that, one of the things I did was to study what I call the great games of the past. Uh, one being the great agriculture game, where as humankind starts to discover agriculture, regions that discover how to master agriculture, irrigation technology, and so forth the most, tend to economically become more productive and also see the rise of more complex societies and, of course, societies that then start to trade. I also look at the great industrialization game and, and the great colonization game, the great global trading game, all of these great eras in our past where different countries or regions have mastered the key capabilities of that time that have allowed them to rise economically and then often subsequently also geopolitically and militarily. And in that sequence, I finally came to, in, a, in the most recent great game before what I call the great tech game, was the great capitalism game, where we see the rise of the US, along with obviously some other countries in the, in the, in the Western European region, uh, who really start to rise economically, right? And I found that the study of that whole phenomenon, that part of our history is very instructive to understand how things are happening today as well, geopolitically and economically. And in that context, I wanted to set that first context, but then I wanted to ask you, as you go back about 150, 200 years and you see the US starting to rise as an economic power, where the established powers at that time are the US, there's of course Germany and other powers in Europe. What do you attribute the rise of the US to? Well, a number of things. I mean, the United States was, was always singularly fortunate in many ways. One is the territory we occupy is, is, is the best geopolitical position on the globe, without a doubt. We face both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. We have territory in the, the Arctic, the temperate and the, and the tropical zones. We have everything from deserts to jungles <clears throat> and enormous agricultural productivity. 
Well, what two things that really, I think, started the United States off. One was that in the 17th and 18th century, situations were often very bad in Europe economically. And a lot of people sat around saying, oh, dear, oh, dear, things are terrible. Somebody's got to do something. But a small group of people said, I'm going to do something. And they sold all their goods, said goodbye to their friends, got on a rickety little boat across a vast ocean in order to improve themselves in a new world. And so the people who populated the United States were all born risk takers in order to improve their lot, which they did. And even by the end of the colonial era, the American colonies were the, had the highest per capita income in the world. One example of this is that in the Revolutionary War, the soldiers of the Continental Army and the soldiers of the British Army were often very closely related, I mean, sometimes first cousins. And yet the soldiers in the Continental Army were averaged two inches taller than those in the British Army. And the only explanation for that is they were fed better as children. And so this country you know, has been rich almost ab initio. The other thing that really helped out, especially in the 19th century, was because the United States was essentially invulnerable from attack. If we were too far away. The only neighbors we have is Canada and Mexico, neither of which ever posed a, a threat to us. We actually, in 1812, we invaded Canada and we got our butts kicked. Um, and so we had a very small military, um, both naval and army, and which meant we had very low taxes. So people could, instead of having to pay high taxes, they could use that money to invest in new entrepreneurial activities. Um, and that's exactly what we did. And so, I mean, the rise of the United States economically, especially after the Civil War, you know, in 1860, we imported all the steel that we used. We didn't make any steel in this country. By 1900, the United States was exporting steel to Britain and Germany and doing so, you know, they, our costs were so much lower that we could export them successfully to the two great steel powers of Europe. Yeah. And so the entrepreneurial zeal and the entrepreneurial spirit to start with, as you said, maybe just very well endowed ab initio. And then the fact that you were, were spending very little on defense and instead focusing purely on productive economic activity seem to be the three main things that you're attributing the rise of the US to. What about, what about the system that gets set in, in the US? So, you know, others have written about the fact that the banking and financial systems that get set in the US maybe help in that entrepreneurial zeal and energy to be converted into productive economic activity, to your point about maybe the steel conversion from being an importer to an exporter. Um, and then people also attribute sometimes to the political system in the US. Like, what, what are your views on the political and the financial systems that get set in the US? and their contribution in the rise of the U.S. Strangely, the United States has struggled its entire existence with the banking system. And we still do not have a very good banking system. We have, we have lots of banks. We also have lots of bank regulators. You know, we have the Federal Reserve. We have the controller of the currency. We have the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, all of those govern banks. Uh, the, you know, and the the problem here, basically, was Alexander Hamilton, who founded the American financial system. He wanted to set up a bank modeled on the Bank of England. It was called the Bank of the United States. And this would be a central bank that would discipline other banks, would transfer money from one part of the country to another, and would be the primary borrowing agent for the government when it needed to borrow. Thomas Jefferson hated banks. He hated any large entrepreneurial activity. He wanted this country to be a, nothing but a, a group of yeoman farmers. It was a, you know, you know, this is George Orwell once said that about a, an idea is so stupid, only an intellectual could believe it. Thomas Jefferson believing that we could be nothing but a bunch of yeoman farmers was a typical idea that only an intellectual could believe. And so the Jeffersonians killed the Bank of the United States in 1812. Um, a new one was set up five years later, um, but Andrew Jackson, a thoroughgoing Jeffersonian, when it came to the finance, he killed it in 1836. And for the next 70 years, the United States was the only major country in the world that had no central bank. 
um, to be a lender of last resource and to, and to supply discipline to the many other banks. Banks that were set up between 1800 and 1810, half of them had failed by 1820. This happened over and over and over again. Bank failure in the, in the, in the United States is American as apple pie. Um, and we, you know, finally in 1913, we set up a new central bank called the Federal Reserve. We didn't get it right the first time. And so after 5,000 banks failed in the early 1930s in the Great Depression, uh, we reorganized the Federal Reserve and we got it mostly right by this time. But we still have 50 states regulate banks as well as the federal government. And so, and we just this year, we had, we had three major bank failures. And the Federal Reserve admitted that it didn't get it right, but it was partly, you know, it, it didn't prevent the Silicon Valley Bank from having such a concentration of deposits. I mean, all the depositors, they were all in the same business, essentially. And that's, you know, narrow bases are always weak bases. And so we still have, you know, work to do on the banking system, on the financial system. On the other hand, Wall Street has worked very, very well um, since the very beginnings in 1792, when we started trading on Wall Street. It, it grew and grew. And after we had, in the 1860s, we had a sort of Wild West period in Wall Street, in which there was, nobody was regulating it. The, you know, the New York state government was completely corrupt. At that time, it was, you know, they used to joke that, you know, the businessman needed not only a lawyer, he needed a judge. As a <laughs> but after Wall Street cleaned up its act and starting in 1869 and rapidly grew to be the, you know, the, as large as London and as important as London, and especially after the Atlantic Cable was laid in 1866, so that New York and London could act as one, you know, one market essentially, because you could communicate instantly, and a market can never be larger than the area within which communication is essentially instant. Um, and that's actually that's what made New York the center of the financial world. Was once the telegram, a telegraph came in in the 1840s, every New York was already the largest. Um, securities market in the country. But now with the telegraph, you, everybody in the whole country could trade on Wall Street. And everybody, of course, you always want to trade in the biggest market because that's where both buyers and sellers get the best prices. And so, you know, by the 1850s, New York was the only major securities market in the United States. And it's been that way ever since. The banking system, you say, is still, you know, imperfect, which, you know, one can argue across the world, very few countries where you could point to a banking system and say this is perfect. But let's say it's a work in progress everywhere. The financial system you are attributing to obviously the growth of the US market, interlinkages with the superpower of that time, the UK, let's say, and that helps. What about the political system? Because you know, there are books that have been written about other places in the world which were economically well endowed, which had, you know entrepreneurial people, but did not see the kind of economic rise that the U.S. does. So do you feel the political system was more like the banking system, imperfect, but sort of meandering around, along? Or was it more like the financial system, where there were maybe some po more positives than negatives? Well, there's no such thing as a, a perfect political system, at least not on this planet. That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I would never will be. But I think the United States has had a has done pretty well. I mean, I would, one example I'd love to give is that the U.S. Constitution came into effect on April 30th, 1789. The French Revolution broke out two and a half months later, in July 14th, 1789. Well, here we are, 230 odd years later. The United States is still operating under that same constitution, amended only 27 times, and most of those were trivial or were didn't affect how the government was run. It just affected personal rights, like the Bill of Rights. In France, meanwhile, they've had three kingdoms, two empires, and five republics. And I'm a great admirer of France, but French genius does not extend to politics. Where I think the children of England, we all are have really good political systems. You know, the concept of the rule of law is, and the, the concept of liberty, that people should be free to do as they please unless there's a good reason not to allow it. And wherever the British have 
have been, they usually set up very successful political system. In the United States, you know, the Australia, Canada, India, for instance, is you know the world's largest democracy, and I think that's largely due to the to the British Raj. Yeah. Well, that's a whole conversation altogether about the British Raj in India. Uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, but without getting into that, like there are two pieces here that I, w- I want to dig a bit deeper on more. So you must be familiar with the work of Alfred Chandler also. One of the things that the US does really well in this period that we are talking about is this idea of managerial capitalism, where you suddenly start to see slightly more complex organizations come up that can manage larger businesses, larger scopes, right? And more specialized functions within that compared to the business organization that pre- precedes that, which is that of a family run business or a small, typically single function, single industry business, right? Talk to me more about your view on that. Like, is that something that you feel was a particularly US invention, this idea of a large, complex managerial business led by managers and, you know, this kind of managerial bureaucracy that starts to uh, help large organizations function? Or is that something that you feel is not necessarily a big factor in the rise of the US? Oh, I think it's a very big factor in the rise of the U.S. Um, Remember, in the late 19th century, especially after the Civil War in America, well, at the beginning of the Civil War in 1860, the largest industrial enterprise in the country was the ironworks in in Maine, and they they employed 4,500 people. That was the largest company in in terms of employees in the country. By 1900, there were dozens of companies that had over 10,000 employees, and some of them had 50 or 60,000 employees, and they had to learn how to manage that. Because previously, most businesses had been run by the people who owned them. And they, they had a, a great interest in you know, the return on capital and, and profit. But after the Civil War, ownership and management tended to separate. Because I mean, the, the stock market, you know, the stocks were owned by various investors, but the managers they had their own, and until we learned how to operate that way, and how to, how to control the managers, um, we had a lot of, you know, what today would be regarded, you know, as grossly illegal. I mean, for instance, the, the Union Pacific Railroad, which was established in, um, by Congress in 1863, if I remember correctly, um, they, the, the management of the Union Pacific Railroad promptly established their own construction company owned by the managers gave it a fancy French name, Credit Mobile, and they hired their own company to build the Union Pacific Railroad and overcharged the Union Pacific Railroad wildly. And they were they were having dividends every year of 900 percent. Also, they were bribing Congress right, left and center. And when the Credit Mobile scandal broke in 1872, one third of the members of Congress lost their seats. Um, and richly deserved to lose them, too. Um, We had to learn how to govern huge industrial corporations that were no longer owned by the the people who managed them. And then we did. It took us half a century. But I think, you know, other countries had to learn these lessons, too. Uh, But by 1913, the Clayton Antitrust Act, um, I mean, one thing we did was we discovered that we needed a system of bookkeeping that was uniform throughout the economy. Um, this is now called generally accepted accounting principles. Okay. And in beginning in the 1880s and 90s, uh, Wall Street, not government, but Wall Street began demanding that companies that they wanted their stock traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and if they wanted to have their stocks underwritten by the Wall Street Bank, that they were going to have to start keeping All of their these books. Rules. Accepted accounting principles, and to have those books certified by independent accountants. Um, now that seems, you know, as obvious as could possibly be. But in that time, I mean, the companies weren't happy about it at all. But they didn't have a choice. Um, and the one um, misfortune is that Wall Street didn't have the power to force government to keep its books honestly, and they don't. <laughs> well, some might argue the other way around, also. Like the books of the Wall Street banks are maybe also not as sacrosanct as they. Could be. 
Oh, well, there will always be cheaters, of course. And they usually end up, you know, voiced on their own petard eventually. Yeah. And so, you know, you've obviously written this book uh, about Wall Street. And uh, you call it, if I'm not wrong, The Great Game as well. I, of course, call my book The Great Tech Game. But uh, And you talk about The Great Game in the sense of the Wall Street, emergence of Wall Street as a global power, right? And you're obviously attributing a lot of the U.S. rise, both directly and indirectly, to the rise of Wall Street and the financial system that it uh, engenders. What helps the U.S. get this Wall Street piece right at that time and not, let's say, other countries as well? Well, because Wall Street grew so quickly, especially after the Civil War. I mean, in 1860, Wall Street was by far the most important financial center in the United States. But compared to London, it was very, very small. By the end of the war, when the United States had borrowed $2 billion in government bonds, Wall Street was the second largest securities market in in the world after London. And that money, those $2 billion worth of bonds were basically uh, from the UK, like the UK investors had bought into those or who had funded? No, actually, actually it was mostly funded ourselves. What we did was a man named Jay Cook, who was a banker from Philadelphia, and the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, asked him to um, establish, you know, bond buying. And what he did is he issued, he got the Treasury to issue bonds as, as small as $500. Um, or even $50. And he went out to the public and he advertised and he said, you know, buy these bonds. They're, it's much better than the, keeping the money under the mattress. You're earning interest when you buy these bonds. And so we were, the Civil War was mostly self financed. We didn't borrow from England that much. We borrowed an awful lot of capital from England to build the American economy, but that was in the private market, not the public market. Interesting. So you were saying that after the after the Civil War ends, now the Wall Street is massive in terms of the bond economy and, and others. So let's say that Civil War period allows the scale to come in. But what else causes the rise of the Wall Street phenomenon in the US? You would attribute it to certain individuals as well? Or were there some systemic factors that were other than the Civil War that were leading to the positive development or evolution of Wall Street? Well, financial market in, in a country is always going to be a, a, an artifact of the size of the economy. The larger the economy, the larger the financial market is going to be. And by probably 1880 or so, the United States had the largest um, economy in the world. And, and just it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger relative to other countries. So that was, you know, that's why Wall Street got so big. But, you know, the reason I called it the great game is because it is a game. I mean, mathematically speaking, I mean, there's a you know, there are winners and there are losers, and there's a way of keeping score. Now, in Wall Street, you keep the scores kept in money. And so, and people like, you know, a lot of people like um, Commodore Vanderbilt, who became the largest owner of railroads in the world. Um, and when he died in 1877, was the richest man in the world, other than some sovereign heads. Um, he, didn't, he, he wasn't all that interested in living well. I mean, he did live well, but he wasn't interested. It was his children who built all those mansions on Fifth Avenue. He does love to play the game. He loved to play all games. He was a terrific poker player and, and uh, <laughs> as well as. <laughs> and um, so he just enjoyed the game of Wall Street because that's what it basically is. But it's a game where you, you know, where you in effect create money. So, yeah. No, so, so that's, I, I think that's fascinating uh, that. The great game, as let's say Vanderbilt is defining it and as you're defining it at the time, and why you call your book The Great Game when you talk about Wall Street, is that capital, accumulation of financial capital, seems to be the metric on which you would be the winner of that game. And the lack of financial capital accumulation means that you'd be a relative loser in that game. If I were to now switch gears, the reason I call my book The Great Tech Game is coming from a fairly similar premise. I also believe that today there's a competition going on. There's a game going on. There are winners and losers in this game. But now instead of just financial capital being what you want to accumulate, accumulation of technology is now the metric upon which both nations, individuals, and corporations are measuring themselves 
and whoever ends up accumulating the most and the most frequently able to invent more and more technology that is used by as many people around the world as possible, the more likely you are to be a winner. And hence the game today, in my mind, is different from that time, uh, the period that you cover uh, in your book on, on, on the Wall Street, about the Wall Street piece. Today it's different in a couple of different ways. One, as I mentioned, the factor that you're looking to accumulate more of has changed. It's not that capital is no longer important. I work in the field of venture capital and in a way technology and capital together, financial capital together, to me is the duopoly of our world. Whoever has those two is, I would say, likely to be the winner of this game. Uh, so that's one piece that lets it maybe different from that time. And second, I believe that the game has become truly global now. That while you're right that financial capital in a, or, or the size of the financial sector of a country is you know, very much linked to the size of the overall economy, I feel as far as technology is concerned, you could possibly see, though it's not very common, but you could possibly see smaller countries, smaller markets that are richer on the technology front than their economy, the rest of the economy might suggest. Thoughts on either of those two premises? No, I, I think you're right. We, we live in a whole new world due to the invention of the microprocessor in 18 or 1968, I think was the first time, and it was commercialized in 1972. And so in the last 50 years, we have had a revolution unseen in, in economically since the steam engine was invented, or he didn't invent it, he, he greatly improved it by James Watt. That's and true. so suddenly the energy became cheap for the first time in human history because of the steam engine. Well, now the storage manipulation and retrieval of information has now become extremely cheap. I mean, just I wrote a piece for a magazine in the United States called The New Criterion, in which I traced the history of writing and stuff. And I said, it's now possible you can have in your shirt pocket and something you know no bigger than a cell phone. You can have literally a library of a million books in yes, your sir. shirt pocket. And that is, you know, that's an astounding change. And so we live in a whole new economic world now from the one I grew up in, in the 50s and 60s. And it's, it's been very exciting to uh, see what's, what's gone on because of an invention of the microchip. But now and also communication has become instant all over the world. I mean, we're talking now, you're in India and I'm in the United States. And, um, you know, I can remember, I remember as a child, I remember my grandmother saying, you children be quiet. Your grandfather's talking long distance. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Now no right. such thing. Well, well, that message I still have to convey to my children. I just don't use the words long distance, maybe, but I have to tell them that, listen, I'm doing a podcast, so <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the messaging remains the same. But, but you know, but that, that also, you know, Mr. Gordon, uh, uh, raises another very interesting question. So when you look into history and you look at the time of the invention of the steam engine, one can argue that the steam, the invention of the steam engine happens, or the improvement, as you rightly point out, but James Watt happens in the UK. The UK is a big beneficiary of that. Countries like India, which had before this colonial era, before this industrial era, were probably relatively richer, better off, more productive than countries like the UK suddenly start to become relative losers. And so one of the conclusions I draw in the book, in my book as well, is that, and I think this you're alluding to in your remarks just now, and also I think in the article you mentioned to me earlier, which we can get to about how to change the world, is that the, the region or the country or the firms that see the emerging technology that will reduce, let's say, as you rightly say, the cost of a certain input in the productive process and leverage that to build applications of that technology right, that, that can then allow them to become larger economies or larger producers of different goods and services tends to win, right? I mean, that's a, that's a basic conclusion one can draw. And the UK benefits from that invention of the steam engine or that improvement. But the question to you is, how does the US see that at that time? 
Does the U.S. see this as an invention now that is is the stranglehold of the U.K.? Or does it at that time, do the entrepreneurs of the U.S. say, it might have been invented there, but that doesn't stop me from using it here. And now I'm going to maybe go even faster in the adoption of it, even though the invention has happened somewhere else. Well, yeah, I mean, the British also invented the railroad. I mean, the first practical railroad, the Manchester and Liverpool Railroad of 1829. Um, but we promptly started importing British um, technology, and then we started building our own. And by 1860, the United States had the biggest railroad network in the world, and it kept getting bigger. By 1900, we had about 250,000 uh, miles of railroad in the United States. And so, you know, the British invented it, but we promptly uh, expropriated it for our purposes. You know, we didn't, you know, we're happy somebody invented the railroad. I'm sure it would have been invented sooner or later by by somebody, of course, because again, it made transportation cheap and much faster. I mean, the example I like to give is in 1829, when Andrew Jackson went from Nashville to Washington to be inaugurated as president, it took him a month by horse and carriage to get from Nashville to Washington. By 1860, you'd get from Nashville to Washington in two days, thanks to the railroad. And so, so at that point, obviously, there is no intellectual property uh, restrictions on the transfer of such technology from the UK to the US. As far as I know, the, neither the locomotive nor um, the, the idea of the railroad itself was ever patented. I'm not sure you could patent it. Um, and the steam engine, the patent had long since expired. Um, and so it was, we, yeah, we could use it freely. Um, and also, we were, you know, we were not above a little industrial espionage either. I mean, the British cloth industry, for instance, they were, they jealously guarded the technology. And you were not allowed to, ex, you know, if, if you had that, you knew had the technology, you couldn't take plans out of the UK. And so Samuel, I think his last name. I can't think of it at the moment, but anyway, he had been busy in the tech industry, and he memorized <laughs> all the, the, you know, the machinery that was necessary, and he came to the United States and duplicated it. And so by 1860, again, we had a very large cloth industry ourselves, thanks to what well, was, quite frankly, industrial espionage. Well, that's right. So, you know, if, if, you, if one was to start drawing parallels now to, to today's world, where espionage of technology, right? So tech secrets today are being, if to, if, if, you know, at the time that we're talking about, the US is the, the country that wants to adopt technology being invented elsewhere, but then go much further in its adoption and its uh, diffusion. One can argue that today China is in that position vis-a-vis -vis the US, where, the US is claiming that obviously a lot of technology being designed, developed, invented in the US gets stolen by the Chinese and possibly by others around the world. But today we have a much different system of intellectual property that tends to guard these industrial secrets than maybe existed at the time when the US is rising vis-a-vis -vis the UK. Oh, indeed. It was, you know, we have a much better system now, although the, the Chinese certainly are very good at industrial espionage. And that's that's just inevitable. And um, so I'm not terribly aware the United States has always been the world's most creative country. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not an accident that the Americans have won something like one third of all the Nobel Prizes ever awarded, even though we make up only about 5% of the world's population. And uh, so I'm not worried about other people stealing our technology. But but that raises the question, right? So if if invention is invention more critical today to build a bigger economy and a faster growing economy, or is it the adoption and the possible duplication, adoption and diffusion? That's a question I struggle with a lot because I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you a specific reason too. So within India. 
often the conversation is in the venture capital and startup world for the last decade as that ecosystem has grown in india the one of the main criticisms that people have had of the startup ecosystem in india and this is a criticism that the chinese also faced for quite some time was that the startup entrepreneurs were mostly copying business models technology uh, and other system that were being developed in the us amazon gets developed as a you know model of e-commerce in the us then a similar copycat model comes up in india um uber gets developed in the us and then its equivalent comes up in india and so often then the conversation becomes that is duplication enough you know it it does develop those businesses here but then you do struggle you do struggle with building real profitable businesses often because the moment you are copying a technology or a business then by definition more people can copy it as well and the business becomes relatively commoditized and hence the profit margins of any business then uh, that doesn't have core invention or core technology that's protected at its core your profit margin suffers so you will find that the indian startup ecosystem will often suffer from big markets big top lines but then the profit margins are really not where you want them to be and you compare them to let's say a google an apple uh, a microsoft etc and you look that actually the companies or like qualcom etc and you look at these tech companies in the us that have really built core ip and are fiercely protecting it those tend to have massive cash balances on their balance sheet so it almost seems like adoption and diffusion of technology doesn't seem to be enough anymore well um, it may take a little bit longer um than it used to um but that's always going to happen is you're going to you know as long as you have a monopoly as long as you have a patent on a, something that everybody wants uh then you're going to make out like a bandit and profit wise but eventually as you say it gets commoditized other you know the patents run out other people can then patent you know imitate it and you're you know your profit margin suffer but things like amazon which is invention was simply a way of doing business and it's now what the economists call an installed base i mean if i want something i just go to amazon to get it i'm sure i can get it in other places but i don't i just go to amazon i get you know three or four packages a week from amazon and i don't think that's going to change anytime soon i mean the, the business was it was very creative of of jeff bozos um to come up with this idea 30 years ago now and he started off just with books uh but now he sells everything that's legal and you know it's just it's absolutely amazing i have i put it in an order of amazon and it's on my front porch within 24 hours usually well, that's just that's just extraordinary correct and 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 it's no longer as you rightly say in the tech world it's a combination of technological invention so one can argue that google's search engine is a technological invention that they are fiercely protecting and fighting off any possible challengers on amazon however is not necessarily a tech invention that they are protecting but the efficiency of their service is their moat right and and they call it jeff bezos i think has also called it the flywheel effect the faster yeah. they get things to you the more you buy the more you buy the more sellers want to sell on amazon the more money amazon can keep and you know the 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 wheel the flywheel continues right but by definition in, as a result of both these tech inventions of the kind let's say that google search engine or even google's operating system android etc fall under and the business process inventions that companies like Amazon have come up with it's seemingly much harder to overcome these advantages and moats that these large tech companies today have than seemed was the case in the past which makes you think that maybe the the US rise will last for longer than uh, than than the UK's than the UK empire did yeah so of course the united states is, has been almost this is beginning a much larger country than the UK and endowed with you know much more limited natural resources 
whereas the UK, they had iron and coal, which was very important in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. But other than that, they're, <clears throat> uh, they've had to import most things. Japan is even worse in terms of it has some coal, but that's just about it in terms of natural resources. I mean, so Japan has had to import things from the very beginning. And but it's still one of the richest countries in the world because it's also a very entrepreneurial country um, and a very creative country. And so not having natural resources doesn't make isn't all that important. And having them isn't all that important either. I mean, Argentina, for instance, is a richly endowed country. Um That's and yet right. it's been a, a political mess for the last hundred years. That's right. Um and they have no, no financial discipline. They, you know, they just, they print money when they need it. And you know, whenever politicians have the power to print money, guess what? They're going to print it until the monetary system falls apart and they have to start over again. Happens. You know, never let a politician anywhere near the power to print money. No, that's that's right. I think uh, these examples are very apt. But the example that the country that you don't mention is China. So. Uh, if anyone wants to today talk about a possible challenger to the U.S. dominance of you know the world's economy, geopolitics, military, it's China. Uh, the U.S. acknowledges that um, recent last two three years have been messy to say the least between the two. Clearly, because the the incumbent feels the the threat is is very real from the challenger. The challenger seems to feel they have a real shot at it. But unlike the U.S. and the U.K., when this transition happens between the U.K. and the U.S., there's almost a very different uh, context to that transition, right? Very different context. The context today is very different between the U.S. and China. So how do you view this possible transition or possible change in, uh, in, in power dynamics between these two nations today in the keeping in mind the historical context of the earlier transitions that we've seen in history. Well, I'm not particularly worried about China. I mean, it's certainly what has happened in China in the last 50 years since the death of Mao Zedong in 1976 has been one of the extraordinary chapters in, in human history. And China is now, if not yet a rich nation, it's certainly vastly richer than it was. But the reason it became so much richer was they allowed capitalism to come creeping in. Um, I mean, communism is a guarantee of eternal poverty for all but the very top of the society. But the current head of China, Xi, is in effect making going the other way. And so I mean, he's cutting down on, on entrepreneurial freedom and imposing more and more. All companies, I think, that have over 100 employees now have to have a, a member of the Communist Party on their board of directors. Um, Things like that. And also, I mean, China is growing old very much more quickly than the United States is. And because the Chinese people have simply stopped making babies and you know, they abandoned the disastrous one child policy. They're now trying to get people to have more children and they're, they're not succeeding. And so the Chinese population could fall by, you know, to be well under a billion by 2050. And, and it's getting very much older and very, very quickly. So is Japan, by the way. Whereas the United States, although our birth rate is is below the 2.1 children per yeah. male, but we have such a large immigration that that keeps us young. We're still we're you know we're now I believe the average American average age of Americans is 39 uh, years. In 1820, it was 17. Yeah, India's at 25. India, okay. India, the average age is around 25. 25. Okay. But yeah, with a billion and yeah, 1.3 billion people. No, so that's right. I mean, I think that I I I, I agree with your assessment on the population uh, projections for China. I agree with you that the clampdown on entrepreneurial freedom to some extent. So if you were to look at that as labor, entrepreneurial sort of freedom of the entrepreneurs there, and then you look at capital, as you rightly said, there's maybe a move away from the, the kind of capitalism that the US, the Chinese did adopt over the last three decades. There's one piece, however, that seems to be at the center of concern, right? Which is that of technology, right? As I was saying earlier, for me, the game has changed. The game is not so much about people. It's about people also. It's also about capital and financial capital and the capitalistic system. But it's 
as much if not more now about technology. So countries that are able to develop that kind of technology today are able to generate great amounts of wealth. It's like, you know, Adam Smith called it, called it the wealth of nations. In my book, I, I call technology as the new wealth of nations. And there, through various means, some which we've already spoken about on industrial espionage, but even otherwise, in terms of invention, entrepreneurial tech companies, there, there's a lot of tech development in, in, in China that seem, you know, whether you look at the traditional consumer internet tech companies, but now increasingly even uh, technological wave, more recent technological waves like artificial intelligence, 5G, biotechnology, climate technology, solar technology, the Chinese seem to have a very strong hold and a clear strategy and a long-term clear strategy on how to become a technological nation and a technologically one of the most advanced nations in the world. So, you know, as you said about the U.S., even when the U.S. is rising, not everything gets done perfectly, right? The financial system might work well, but maybe the banking system is not working well. The political system is working well, but there is also a lot of corruption. There is some industrial espionage, but there's also entrepreneurial zeal. So if you look at China today, I almost feel like you're seeing a similar mix of positives and negatives, but it's not a very clear one way or the other picture. So one would think that, you know, that, that you do tend to see lots of reasons for a rise uh, of, of, of China. Well, I think, but also remember that Pyrenees are always fragile, whereas democracies are always strong. Democracies, they can reform themselves. Tyrannies never can, because the guy at the top can never be wrong. And usually he doesn't want to hear bad news. And so people, you know, they, tyrants tend to shoot the messenger. And so they're, you know, they tend to collapse after a while. I mean, that's what happened in the Soviet Union. And I think, you know, China, you know, there's an old saying in, in, in international politics that you don't have to worry about rising powers. You have to worry about falling powers. They're the dangerous ones. I think, you know, that's why I think China is no longer a rising power. I think it's it's reached its peak and as things are stresses are beginning to show up in China that make it very nervous, which also makes it very dangerous. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're currently working on this piece that you mentioned, How to Change the World. Yeah. I wanted to learn more about that. Uh, you want to walk us through the overall idea that, uh, that underlies that piece that you're writing? There are a great many inventions every year, and some of them are really great ideas. I mean, putting wheels on suitcases. Now, we should erect a monument to whoever thought that idea of. But it didn't change the world. It just made it airports a lot easier to negotiate. So in order to change the world, what you have to do is reduce the cost of a fundamental input into the economy by a, at least a factor of 10. And if you do that, then you will change the world. Um, for instance, the printing press in the middle of the 15th century in, in Europe in 1450, there were 50,000 books in all of Europe, and almost all of them were in monasteries and in universities, which meant they were under the control of the church. By 1500, there were 10 million books in Europe, almost none of them under the control of the church. And so what the printing press did was it made information much, much, much cheaper. I mean, because before the printing press, books had to be copied. So, um, and it's, it's individual book was enormously expensive. Um, by 1500, they were, if not cheap, they were, um, you know, by several orders of magnitude cheaper than they had been 50 years earlier. And that's what changed the world. That ended the Middle Ages, that ended the monopoly of the church on, on religion in Western Europe. And, and remember that the, the Protestant Re Reformation was carried out in an absolute blizzard of pamphlets and posters so, um, that printing made possible. The steam engine reduced the cost of energy by a factor of at least 10, probably more like 100, um, and could do all kinds of things that couldn't be done before. Um, and today, the microprocessor is, again, radically reducing the, the cost of, of information storage and retrieval and manipulation. I mean, that's why I mean, every high school student today has in his backpack computing power that the Pentagon could not have afforded in 1950. And that is changing the world right before our eyes. Um, if you want to go... Back to the beginning, probably the first world-changing technology was fire. That's right. 
we had fire a lot long before we learned how to create fire. We had to go find it. And I've acted with a very interesting movie called uh, Quest for Fire about 40 years ago. And it's really quite an interesting movie, I think. Um, but anyway, fire allowed us to protect ourselves from predators because um, they were animals are always afraid of fire. Um, it allowed us to stay up later at night. Um, now, we're not quite sure when language fully developed, probably like 50,000 years ago, which is long after fire. But the most important thing that fire did was it allowed us to digest things much more quickly and easily and cheaply. It took, you know, just to give you an example, take a, a T-bone steak. If you're hungry enough, you can eat a T-bone steak in 10 minutes. If you have to eat that steak raw, you're going to be doing a lot more chewing. Um, it's going to take a lot more energy for you to um, digest that steak. That's and therefore, it reduced the, the amount of time people had to spend eating. No, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, a similar argument has been made about the invention of agriculture, right? Where now suddenly the productivity of uh, 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 an agriculturalist vis a vis a hunter gatherer goes up, uh, the better seeds you have, the better education you have, and you're suddenly producing more than 10x more than um, the next person. And that gives you not just now, like fire helps you digest easier and faster and gives you time. Agriculture gives society more time because now you need fewer people focusing on growing the food. And now people argue that that's what allows complex societies with different professions to develop. And that leads to trade because now everyone's growing different things, different products, different services. I mean, um, poor, so yeah, all of these inventions in history have had massive ramifications. Indeed. And they seem to be coming faster and faster. And also they have subsidiary inventions. I mean, the most important subsidiary invention of the steam engine was the railroad, That's which true. made transportation much faster and much cheaper. Today, the great subsidiary invention of the, of the microprocessor is the internet, um, which is just you cannot overestimate the importance of the internet to how much it's changing the world. Yes. Um, and it is, yeah, you know, like, yeah. I mean, Google is essentially an index to everything. <laughs> you know, before the internet, if I want, I had to go look in the index of book after book after book to find the knowledge and information that I needed. Now I can Google it and boom, I got it in, in five seconds. Well, that's right. Um, no, that's right. That's right. And of course, now Google is worried about chat GPT. Uh, and open AI. Um, but yeah, I, I, you call them, uh, I think, subsidiary inventions. Um, I call them uh, waves within the, you know, given game, right? I mean, so the Industrial Revolution sees these three or four big waves, the steam engine, railroads, then it sees electricity, right? Uh, these are sort of the major subsidiary inventions. And then one can argue even the automobile. And similarly with the tech, as we know it today, there's the semiconductor, there's the internet. Now people are arguing artificial intelligence is going to be yet another one of those, you can call them waves or you can call them subsidiary inventions as you say, as you term them. But each of these subsidiary inventions, for me, interestingly, and I love your view on this, allows new winners and losers to emerge. So if you have one of the steam engine game, then it's not necessary that you will win at the railroad game. If you won at the railroad game, there's no guarantee that you'll win at the electricity game, you know, the sub games. And to me, you know, as I think about the great tech game, I, I believe that with each wave or each subsidiary invention that's major, like the internet is currently or artificial intelligence promises to be, you might see emergence of new winners and losers because sometimes incumbents just don't um, focus on the right thing in the next emerging wave. Yes, well, that, you know, people get set in their ways. I mean, Kodak dominated exactly. um, American photography and world photography for years. It's no longer in business. Um, That's because right. Once digital photography came around, Kodak just could not adapt to it. And so it became a dinosaur. And that happens all the time. And also sometimes very surprising winners you don't think about. Or yeah, no, I mean, Nokia is another example, Blackberry. People talk about it in the context of Apple, right? I mean, BlackBerry was in 2007, probably massive market shares did Nokia. And then suddenly the Apple iPhone comes around and uh, they just don't see that smart smartphone 
wave coming, you know, and uh, Nokia and BlackBerry just missed that complete uh, wave uh, completely. And BlackBerry, I think, is now almost gone, if not gone fully. And there's several such examples in, 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 I think, technological waves. And I think that's partly why one can argue that the U.S. and U.S. tech firms are paranoid about, if I may use that word, paranoid about any tech challenges. Because in technology, the pace as it, as we are seeing the development of technology is now moving at such a fast pace that compared to history, that you actually, you've got to be paranoid about that next guy, that next startup, that next entrepreneur. Whereas I think if you talk about the context of fire and agriculture and even the steam engine, the pace of development of technology was much slower, it seems. Um, and hence you needed not, you didn't need to be as paranoid. But today it's almost like the winner at the great tech game has got to be paranoid. Yeah, there's certainly it's speeded up tremendously. I mean, we're only 50 years past the invention of the semiconductor. The world has already changed beyond recognition. But the steam engine was patented in 1769. But by, what, 1719 or 1819, the world hadn't changed all that much. It was easy to change, but it took much longer. I mean, it wasn't up until the mid-19th century. Then That's when the world, by that time, the world had really changed thanks to the steam engine, but it took much longer. Now it takes, you know, new inventions change the world overnight. One invention that I think is not getting enough attention at the moment is Elon Musk and SpaceX, the reusable rocket. That's uh, this hugely reduces the cost of, of space travel and everything. Imagine how much it would cost to fly from New York to New Delhi if that, after the plane landed, it was dragged off the airport and and thrown into a landfill. Um, <laughs> That's right. Well, that's what they used to do with rockets, and now they're reusing them. It's absolutely amazing because I love to watch them when they're, you know, they're a new takeoff, and the rocket comes down and lands, boom, right on the spot, and you now it's ready to fly again in a couple of weeks. That's an amazing that's technology. It's going to have profound effects. Yeah, yeah. No, I think the the, the definition of our world might no longer be limited to the earth, right? Uh, if this technology pans out the way people are expecting it to. But you know, uh, when we've spoken about the economic implications of such technological invention, how it gives the inventors and also the fast adopters a key economic advantage. We've, talking, we've talked about the geopolitical implications, right? Uh, of countries that manage to ride this technological plus capitalist wave fast and well. We've not spoken about the societal implications of these technological inventions as much. So I want to ask you, as you've been writing this article on how to change the world, are you thinking about that piece? How, like much like you were talking about the Gutenberg Press, right? I mean, Gutenberg Press reduces the input from an economic productive activity standpoint. But as you also pointed out, it completely transforms the religious landscape in Europe. Uh, and possibly you can argue uh, many other parts of the world. Uh, and so for today's technological inventions, I feel maybe we're not discussing enough the social, cultural, and uh, changes to our values that these technological inventions inevitably uh, engender. Well, I think certainly whenever you change the world, you change not just the economy, you change the society, and therefore you change politics. And the best example of this I can think of is in 1760, the United Kingdom was run by about 150 to 200 families. They're the only ones who counted politically. Um, by 1860, the United Kingdom was being run by the, by the middle class, not by the aristocracy. And the reason was the Industrial Revolution greatly empowered the middle class. Suddenly there was a way of becoming very, very, very rich other than through land, uh, which was the, the power base of the aristocracy. Um, and in 1827, a young British novelist um, coined the word millionaire. Um, he actually borrowed it from the French um, in order to describe this new, very rich class. They, they didn't have land, they weren't traders, but they had, they had factories and he called them millionaires. The young British novelist went into a different line of work, his name Benjamin Disraeli. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so if I can push further on that a little bit. So what's your sense on the, if the Industrial Revolution leads to the creation of a middle class, 
And that obviously changes our politics. I also talk about, in my book, one of the other big implications of the Industrial Revolution for society, which was this, and I think you were alluding to it, this battle between labor as a factor of production almost, and the people who were in that class with the other class that was the capitalist class or the industrial capitalist class. So there's that class conflict. And that sees eventually in the, you know, in Europe also, but elsewhere also this idea of a welfare state emerge, uh, because that's the only way you can manage the politics of these of this class conflict that many famous uh, folks have written about. Uh, not, not, not to mention just Marx, but many people have written about that class conflict. Uh, so if you were to try and like pull out some learnings for today's technological revolution and what I call the great tech game, what are your thoughts on the key societal implications that we are starting to see? I'm not at all certain that I know. Um, I mean, power will shift, but how it will shift is, you know, I think, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure anybody else does either. We're just going to have to find that out. And we're going to have to learn what new rules are needed to make our new society work. For instance, right now, we have discovered, thanks to Elon Musk, by the way, when he bought Twitter, that the United States government was stepping all over these things like Twitter and Google in order to get them not to convey information that the United States government didn't want them to convey. This was a patent violation of the First Amendment. They were saying, well, we're just preventing misinformation, except that misinformation had a bad habit of turning into real information. And so, you know, we're going to have to develop rules to keep the, the government's thumb out of the social media. And uh, a million other things we're going to have to figure out these rules for. But how, what particular individuals are going to be better off and which one's worse off, or at least not as dominant as they used to be. I mean, you know, Wall Street is not as dominant as it used to be, but it's still um, has a plenty of clout. And um, it's not that's not going to change. I mean, you know, money always has clout in any economic system. Yeah, but you know, I mean, so I, I'll share a couple of thoughts. One is, you know, I mean, one can argue that today Wall Street, the 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 book that you wrote on Wall Street, Today, if someone was writing that book, they might say Sand Hill Road or they might say Silicon Valley is the, the, the global power here where both money and technology tend to reside. And the returns that capital wants today, returns that Wall Street also wants, can only come from technology firms today. And hence, the real power lies there. And so the, that power is shifting, a new elite in, in a way getting created. So if there was the industrial capitalist class, then there was the bankers. Today, one can argue it's the tech titans of our world where, where power resides. The other piece that seems to be happening where people are worried is when you talk about uh, the different socioeconomic classes in a society, uh, if the industrial revolution with all its imperfections leads to creation of this middle class that you were referring to, people are worried that that middle is hollowing out with technology, that there's the elites and there's a great concentration of wealth power happening there. If if you know the if Benjamin Disraeli comes up with the term bill, a millionaire that time, today people are struggling to come up with you know whether it's trillionaire or where this billionaire term will end up finally because there's great concentration of wealth at the top, but then you're finding that the tech firms also tend to not employ as many people as as industries tended to or factories tended to, and so now you are worried. People are worried generally, and in a country like India, especially where you have a massive population, you're really worried that technology is replacing jobs rather than adding to the productivity of the people who are employed currently. So there's this worry that the middle class will hollow out and you will have only jobs that are low value add, like delivery workers, cab drivers, and possibly even that gets replaced with drones and autonomous driving cars. And so there's... There's that real concern. And then the third piece that I'll, I'll also tell you, I've been thinking a lot about, is this idea of, you know, if the industrial, of, of, of the second great divergence, if the industrial revolution leads to the first great divergence that our world has known, as you know, people have written about how there was this 
suddenly like the Western European nations, the industrialized nations see this massive spike in their growth rates and the countries that are not able to industrialize or not allowed to industrialize as colonies or some of those colonial powers see very, very slow, if not negative growth rates. And you see this great divergence between nations suddenly. Uh, and today, and you can argue that in the second half of the 20th century, many of those East Asian nations, China, Korea, Taiwan, including India over the last few decades, have managed to uh, reduce that divergence. But now people are worried that in the, on the international scale, that with this kind of concentration of tech power, concentration of tech inventions, concentration of wealth in a few individuals, few farms, you're seeing, again, a second great divergence between nations, not just within nations, but also between nations. Well, I think that's true. And I think that's something to worry about. I mean, in the United States, American politics right now are in a, in a transition era. I mean, the Democratic Party simply isn't the party that it was 50 years ago, the party of Lyndon Johnson and, and John Kennedy. Uh, today, the, the Democratic Party is basically the party of the elite. And <clears throat> also, it is the party of government. Uh, whereas the Republicans, who used to be the country club party, now it's the Republicans who who um, represent the middle class. Um, and and so that's it's going to have interesting implications. I think the election of 2024 is going to be deeply significant. Um, yes. And we but we will see. But yeah, but I think you know countries can become very rich very quickly. I mean, there's an example I've always liked to say that you know the trouble with economics is it's very difficult to do experiments. It's sort of like astronomy. We have to wait for heavens to do the experiment for us. You know, but if we could take a country that's economically and culturally homogeneous, like say Sweden, cut it in half, made one half communist, one half um, democratic capitalist, and then just wait and see what happens. Well, we've had a couple of those experiments. One was East and West Germany, and the other was North and South Korea. In 1953, North and South Korea were both absolutely dirt poor. Here we are 70 years later, and South Korea is a first world nation. South Koreans are rich. North Koreans are as poor as they were in 1953. We, we, we do know that freedom tends to make people rich, whereas tyranny makes them poor. No, absolutely. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I would tend to agree with you that democracy, freedom, entrepreneurial freedom, political freedom, uh, all of those are key components, but they seem to be necessary but not sufficient, right? And I think that's the quest I'm on. They are necessary, one can argue and can possibly agree on. <clears throat> Though there are some examples that can prove otherwise, but that's okay. Those seem to be the exceptions of the rule and the rule itself. But just having a democratic system doesn't seem to be sufficient, which is why, like I was asking you those questions about the various factors that lead to the rise of the US. Clearly, it was not just the fact that, you know, you if, if you were to just observe, like for you also, as we were talking about the rise of the US, the democratic system comes towards the end as, as a factor, right? The entrepreneurial zeal of the people, the, the 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 resource allocation you have, the kind of people you have, the kind of energy you have, um, the systems you develop, the banking, the financial, the political, uh, and so on and so forth. Like, and of course, global politics, macro factors. There's various factors at play, and that's why I worry that sometimes if we rely purely on the political system as the driver of economic growth argument, then a lot of democracies can get complacent. Yes, and, and complacency is, is a, a one-way ticket to disaster, a rapidly changing world. But I, as I said at the very beginning, that if the United States has any one great advantage, it was founded by risk takers. We're a profoundly entrepreneurial country. That's We're right. entrepreneurial. And so I, you know, I think it was... Otto von Bismarck is, is was supposed to have said that God looks after three things, fools, drunks, and the United States of America. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, 
I think God helps those who help themselves. But uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so one can argue that risk taking is a key key sort of capability. That entrepreneurial zeal is a key capability. Uh, on top of obviously a democratic system that allows you the political and economic and you know societal freedom to take those risks and be entrepreneurs, right? And I think in a, in a way, uh, I I did read somewhere that you've traveled to India at some point. I don't know if you've been I, recently, but I drove from England to India in 1970 and back. 1970. Yeah. So you'll find that if you come to India today, and please do. I would love to. You'd find that today in India, there's an entrepreneurial zeal, a risk-taking mindset that's rapidly evolving, on top of obviously the democracy that India has built, right? And I think the question then becomes, okay, to what extent does that risk-taking have to really pervade in society for it to translate into major economic gains, right? Is it enough to have a very small community of risk-takers? Or does it really have to become a lot more widespread? You hear about the U.S. history of the time, the late sort of, you know, 1800s, and you hear about this idea of the tinkering garage stories, you know, where you're experimenting with industrial revolution technology or electricity, and you have people coming up with applications of electricity that leads to, you know, the creation of large corporates, but also just a wide range of products that, you know, the U.S. continues to sell today globally. And you question to you then is, is risk taking okay to be confined to a small group or does it really have to pervade society? Because for that, you need a real shift in mindset. Yes, well, I think the, the more widespread the entrepreneurial spirit is, the better it is for the country. Um, and the United States, was, as you say, was full of people tinkering around in garages. Um, today, it's, as you say, the the technological world today is not nearly as capital intensive as the cutting edge of the economy was in, say, 1900. I mean, steel mills are very expensive. Railroads are very capital intensive. That's right. Where tech companies are not nearly so capital intensive. So they can, with starting off with a very small amount of capital, they can create an enormous amount of wealth very quickly. Yeah. No, this has been a fascinating conversation, uh, Mr. Gordon. Thank you for sharing so many pieces of historical anecdotes, but also more importantly, insights from history that uh, you know are relevant for, for today's world, but also just for understanding history for what it was back then. Um, I like to end every podcast with two questions. Um, so I'd like to ask you those uh, before we conclude. The first one is to recommend a book. It can't be yours, it can't be mine, but any other book uh, for people interested in the kind of themes we've spoken about today that you know listeners of this podcast could go pick up. Well, I think of, you could hardly do better than a book called The Wealth and Poverty of Nations by David Landis, L-A-N-D-E-S, yes. published yes. about late 90s. Um, and it's, it's very well written, and it's, it's, it's a big book, 650 pages, but it gives the history of why some countries succeed economically and some countries don't. It's an absolutely marvelous book. I could not praise it too highly. Well, great. I, I'm a big fan of that book. I've read that book probably a couple few different times. As you rightly say, it's a dense book. It's a long book. So you need time and, you know, the right mind space to, to, to grapple with all the themes that it covers. But that's great. I think that's a great book recommendation. And the other piece is, uh, if you can recommend someone you think we should bring on our podcast. Well, I'd recommend Robert J. Samuelson, who's a, um, a columnist for the Wall Street, uh, not the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. And he's very cogent. He's, his columns are wonderful. Great. No, thank you. These are both... Wonderful recommendations. And thank you again for taking the time. It was a pleasure going back into history with you and uh, obviously discussing things that are as pertinent today as possibly they were 100 years ago if we were having this podcast conversation over telegraph cable and not not the sub see internet cables that are facilitating our conversation today. So thank you again for taking the time, Mr. Gordon. Thank you for having me. I greatly enjoyed it.